just try headphones, Chris, just to see. Sure. I got some headphones here. Maybe that'll make a difference. Yep. All right, guys, give us a sec here. Best to iron this stuff out before everything gets going. We did a little test call earlier, and everything was working. Oh, uh, that's a bit. That's a bit better, actually. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll try and work with that. Can you still hear me fine? It's Perfect. Good. Perfectly. Yep. Okay. This All is right. better. All right. Good. So, well, yeah, you were rambling. <laughs> Please continue to do so. You're a uh, river fishing guide for 15, 20 years now, casting instructor. You're in the competitive scene, fly fishing team Canada now for how many years? Long time. Probably yeah. be over five years on uh, Team Can or more, seven or eight years, and then uh, fishing competitively for close to 15 years. So, uh, not I know competitive fishing is not for everybody, but I think there's a lot of things you learn traveling around the world trying to catch fish in unique situations that I can hopefully pa pass along. And you'll probably see that reflected in the flies. Simple, effective. And while these are my go to flies around here, they're also my go to flies anywhere in the world. Awesome. Very cool. So, um, yeah, we kind of uh, touched on it briefly, but yeah, tonight is a uh, few of uh, Ian's flies, and there is a theme to it apart from just flies that catch fish. Tonight is all about flies tied with pheasant tail, right? Yeah, and and we're going to learn is... how to tie this bad boy right here, Chris. Yeah, tell us, we were about. talking a little bit about that before we got started tonight. What is that monstrosity? Oh, can you hear me still, Chris? You froze, yep, but... Uh, I can hear you. Um, so, do you want me to jump into it, Chris? Or Please, well, tell us, tell us a little bit about what that thing is. So I think everyone's okay. A little so before you all like drop off the line, going, "What have I got myself into?" Uh, I brought this as an example of my love of the pheasant tail. So um, yeah, the theme, the three uh, uh, sessions I'm gonna do is is more material based. So my three favorite materials: pheasant tail, hare's ear, and CDC. Probably every fly uh, fisher in the world. Uh, but this, when we were recently in New Zealand, and it's a little bit interesting because it was we did get draw. It was for the Commonwealth Championships last year, right as COVID hit, and right before the competition started, we got pulled back by the government of Canada. Uh, but when I look at uh, this fly, uh, we weren't sure in New Zealand if we were allowed to bring in a you know, full piece of pheasant tail because they are very careful on the materials coming in. Uh, I just brought this as a great example of my love of pheasant tail. So the solution was to really wrap a whole bunch of pheasant tail on a hook, make it look like a fly, put it in your box. And I've just been plucking, like it's now half of what it was before. And I'll probably tonight just pluck from it as we go on. But uh, I just uh, use that as an example of how uh, important these pheasant tail <laughs> flies are to me. And I think yeah, for, for anybody lengths, who wants to sure catch fish regularly. Them. Yeah, that's great. Cool. So let's see what we're actually tying tonight. What are we going to start with here? All right. Uh, and if you do want to tie this at home, just get a whole bunch of pheasant tail <laughs> fires, latch them to a hook. Go yeah. on uh, from there. So I'm going to tie six flies tonight uh, and a bunch of different variations. We'll try to move quite quickly, uh, but please uh, type any questions to Chris. I've got the headphones on. He'll he'll interrupt me. I'll probably do one of these like secret service things and, and see if I can uh, hear what he's saying. But um, uh, and, and, and I like back and forth dialogue. So please, uh, you know, I know it's through Chris, but I think I want to explain how you, how you fish it. I'm happy to answer any questions because uh, my number one thing would be, well, you know, flies are just flies. It's it's really the presentation that matters more than the fly. Uh, but when it comes to flies, my uh, general philosophy is treat them as ammunition. So uh, Chris, on the other end, flies ties some beautiful flies, uh, and there's nothing wrong with tying really uh, beautiful flies that you love and enjoy. Um, but for me, I want simple flies that catch a lot of fish that I'm not afraid to fire that fly close to a, a log. If I hook the bottom, I don't care. Uh, and also from a guiding perspective, you kind of learn to, it's like uh, stripping a car. You get, you get the fly down with its basic forms. And I actually think there's beauty in the simplicity of a fly that works out effectively. So a lot of my flies are pretty simple, but I can tell you, I would gladly take these flies to any river or any lake in the world and feel pretty comfortable using them. I haven't invented a single one. It's just ones I've picked up from world champions and people all over the world. Uh, you've heard a lot. You've probably seen a lot of these ones. I'll just explain how I tie them and the variations I use on them. Okay. So with that, I'm going to jump into it. Let's get after it. So uh, I, I real, real, uh, not to you know ruin the event for everybody, but I'm going to start with a pheasant tail nymph. <laughs> so, <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> uh, you, you probably went, yeah, I, 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 what a surprise. Um and I, and I apologize. I did cut my thumb 
Uh, there's my boo-boo. Um, you know, if you're wondering, uh, it, when you're cutting French fries on a mandolin and you cut a oh. fry-shaped chunk out of your thumb, it impacts your fly tying for a bit. So I haven't been able to tie for a week or two, but I've just got back into it. So if I'm a little, I'm not a great fly tire in the best of times. So if I'm uh, fumble bumbling around, enjoy at home. It's all, it's, it's your own entertainment. You know what? I think that one tip just made the whole thing worthwhile. If you're nervous about tying on a stream and you want a good out for why you're, you're tying so poorly, oh, I just cut my put thumb. I'm all full of rust here. It's a great yeah, just put a Good band aid on your thumb. Just put a band aid on and make up a disclaimers are out of the way. Um, <laughs> so, a couple things about pheasant tail nymphs. Um, my, I mean the say, sizes I usually use are 12 down to an 18. Anything smaller than that, I don't bother with it. Anything bigger than that, eh? I usually use something else. Not that you can't. I mean a size 10. If there's a right uh, mayfly to imitate, go for it. I always think of pheasant tail nymphs as a mayfly. So I'm going to do a hare's ears series. That to me is just more scuds. It's more isopods. It's maybe sulfurs if you're getting into that stuff. But um, not that the fish care. You know, the old joke, I, every fish I catch, I ask. They're not talking, but they eat it. <laughs> um, but it's really the profile that matters. You know, when you're thinking I want to imitate a mayfly, that's how I think. I'm going to pull out a pheasant tail nymph. Yeah. Uh, I don't really care what it is, uh, what the mayfly is. I don't vary the colors of the actual pheasant tail material. So... You know, here's the old pheasant tail sword or whatever the hell they call this, just a pheasant tail. Um, I kind of use the standard brown. Um, if if you really think an olive versus a, a brown one makes a difference for a river nymph, I mean, put them both in water. They're wet. They're dark. They look like food. I, I Yeah, I probably think the glint on the bead makes a much bigger difference than any color of the body on this one. So you'll see a lot of variations I'm going to do are more on the beads and hot spots or no hot spots and then how the sink rate of the fly versus the color or or i don't put any ribs on this as well uh this one so um two two f hooks i like to tie on like a jig hook uh is a really really good one and this is on a, a standard wet fly hook this is a hannock uh barbless uh what is it a 230 230 bl choose your favorite hook um for pheasant tail nymphs, I kind of moved to this one where I like jig hooks for hare's ear. Go figure. <laughs> the one thing I like about this one, it, uh, it, when you get to your smaller sizes, these hooks have less of a uh, 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 or a bigger gape or gap, whatever you want to call it, between the hook eye and the and the point of the hook. When you get into smaller sizes, that can make a difference. So um, I think when you're on a 14 or bigger, a jig hook or a for lack of a better term, a regular hook or a wet fly hook, doesn't matter. Smaller sizes, just pay attention to that bead hanging down uh, because it can really make your ho uh, hookups difficult. So I'm just using um, some standard thread here. I wouldn't get excited about the thread. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap uh, wrap it up here. Color is uh, black on that, though? Yeah, blackish. Uh, it's like a, yeah, it's black. Yeah. <laughs> uh, color doesn't really matter for this one too much. Um, so here we go. And actually, yeah, I'll do this. the lighting's a little weird here. I might put on some glass. So I, uh, I actually turn my uh, vice upside down when I'm tying without it. So again, if it was a jig hook, I wouldn't bother. bother <laughs> I'm from Jersey, bother. Uh, I wouldn't bother with it. Uh, but when I turn that upside down, you can see the hook, uh, the, sorry, the bead kind of hangs down, slot right? Thing. And if I take the thread and wrap it on about a, was that a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. on top of that bead? I can actually lock it in so it fishes like a jig hook. So what this is going to do, you don't have to do this, but especially if you're fishing the Grand or a lot of places where it's a single fly, um, this is a better way to not, it fishes just like a jig hook. So it's going to fish that way. It's going to tap off the bottom. It's not going to snag up as much. I actually, in some of the smaller sizes where I know there are going to be a dropper nymph, I don't bother with it, but you can see that's now, kind of inverted the bead and it fishes just like a jig hook, but you can see that space that going in there. The, so up, yeah. pheasant tail nymphs, I just like the way they do that. It's not a must do. It's just something I would say I do for a lot of my nymphs. Um, so real simple stuff. Take the thread to right where the hook bend starts to happen. So some people tie them short right at the hook point. I go a little past it. I, I like the a little more full body on that. Um, well, let's look, let's use one of these. Um, yeah, so there my flies keeps on giving. Uh, so I like, when I tie a pheasant tail nymph, three pieces of pheasant tail. If you put four, it won't work. Neither will two. The fish will count. Um, 
I'm just <laughs> kidding. It doesn't really matter. That's three or four. Uh, the reason I like three or four is actually just the size of the body. Yeah. Um, it has nothing to do with anything else. Two seems a little thin. Uh, three or four seems about right. So if you can see that, that's just, I've grabbed a clump and I, I, uh, so those who have seen some of the competition nymphs, a lot of people on their pheasant tail will put Coke de Leon, uh, which is, uh, kind of a standard from a fly called a Frenchie. Um, I don't do that on my pheasant tail nymphs. I use the old school tail. I think it gives a better profile. I actually think it fishes better than the other one myself. Uh, so same, soft. you know, about the length of the body catch it in yeah so you're like yeah that's a bit long just pull it back a couple bit okay i'm happy with it life is good you so we've locked it in what i do now is a little different so a lot of people would tie in wire and they'd wrap it we've all seen a pheasant tail done and then they wrap the wire and some people counter wrap it thinking it makes a difference uh the big problem with pheasant tail is durability um so a couple things i do a for speed and for durability i actually fold this back wrap a couple wraps just to lock it in so that locks that in i keep my thread at the base of the the hook uh, so now what i'll do is zap a gap doesn't have to be zap a gap grab your favorite glue i put glue on the body so that's going to lock that sucker in a lot more it's just a durability play and then what i do and this is where you can break it and this is where i'll totally blame the band-aid <laughs> if this happens is just wrap it around the thread a couple times to, and I actually then use the vise if you don't have one no big deal you can just wrap it manually and I just wrap up the hook and you get a really nice little pheasant tail no rib no nothing good to go okay. so my first fly, copper bead, pheasant tail, I won't tie it off because uh, uh, that would be it. So if I could choose one fly to use in any river anywhere, it'd be that one. Yeah. And surprise, surprise, is some of the top competitors in the world showed me their favorite flies. Legit, same one. No rib, no nothing. That's a beauty. Amazing. That's actually pretty durable. And I like the sink rate on it. It's kind of in between a pertagon, which is a... You know, Spanish for a pellet fly that sinks really fast. This gets down pretty fast. There's not a lot of hack on or anything like that. So that's 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 fly number one. The one variation I like is so grab some hairs here, or I'm using some. I can see that some that's a mess. Uh, a bit of fox squirrel, sure. um, anything like that. The next variation. So I would fill my box with a bunch of these with the copper bead. I like taking a clump of, off a hair's mask or something like that. The second variation I'll do is loosely dub and do that. So that is a little bit different fly in the fact that it's got a little bit more going on. Um, it's got this I like in a little bit slower water. I'll fish the other one in faster water because it gets down faster. Uh, this one has a bit more movement to it. It actually fishes a little different. Now I'm getting a little into the details here, but that's going to catch a bit more water. But those two, if you want an imitative nymph and the fish are being tough, this isn't going to spook any fish. This is going to catch fish all day long in most rivers. Uh, I carry those two variations like crazy. So that's my top two. As you can see, that looks fundamentally different. They're fast. They're killer. You can see that okay, Chris? Yep. Yeah, that looks great. Right, can you, so, you can hear me okay? Yep. You can. Okay. Question? I want to make sure. Um, no, we're good. Uh, Dan Steiner, you just want to confirm there was a slot of bead, which it was. We went over that. Quick, say hi to Dan for me. Yeah. Interesting. You you mentioned there that um, you know you like a, a jig hook still for the uh, the hairs ears. I didn't I didn't realize that. Is there any reason for that? Nope. No. Nope. Just uh, just me being first. difficult. Like I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, you have some jig hooks. So I'll do both. Have to use uh, but uh, on some of them, I, I uh, again bigger sizes. As soon as I get to a sixteen, no matter what the fly is, but for maybe because I tie some twelves in that. Mm -hmm. I actually just like the jig hook with it. Okay. There's absolutely no no reason why. <laughs> I guarantee you they both fish the exact same way. I yeah. just like it. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, for, for anyone who's a little hesitant to fish a fly as, as simple as that last one, like just um, last season, I started fishing that style that you have there, Ian, over you know, a, a Frenchie or over um, a regular kind of pheasant tail with a rib. And that was my number one fly last year too. It's crazy how good that thing is. 
Yeah, and, and if you're wondering an order, so the next fly I'm going to tie here, again, I'm going to do a couple quick variations of my, I'm going to do my top three variations of a pheasant tail. Uh, well, maybe more, those are two uh, <laughs> right there. But I, you know, if you're not sure, start with a flashy one. If that's not picking up fish, go to the natural. Or you've gone through a run uh, or a section with it, you know, go back through it, switch, switch off. They like the fly, they like the profile, just take the, the, the shine off it. Uh, and, you know, you can change all the B colors on that one. Copper's a great color. Pink, like the light pink is a really good one. Sure. You know, kind of pewter, gunmetal is good. Um, I don't fish a lot of just silver plain ones. They're good. Um, when I go to silver, I'll show you. I just, again, nothing I say really makes sense. It's just ones I have confidence in. doesn't mean it won't work for you. So here's another copper bead. I'm going to go through, like, kind of tie that other part fast. But so here's here's a couple versions of the flashy version. So here's a Frenchie. Um, I'll do the OG Frenchie in my the variation I like. So same same again. I'm just using orange Vivis Fluorescent thread. Orange, this is eight aught. Sorry, to don't go it off. eight aught's probably pushing my luck. I wouldn't go any thicker than that. Yeah. So it just makes a thick fly. Sorry to cut you off, Ian. Uh, one question: Scott Boysen was wondering uh, how many different variations of color would you tie a bead color to be specific? Would you tie that in? I, I mean, I, you just kind of touched on your favorites, but I think we're all kind of guilty of. I know I've got a ridiculous number of patterns in my box, not just flies, but different patterns. And, you know, not all of them have uh, have a chance to get wet. So, yeah. So first I'd say um, find the flies you like yeah. and then just tie a ton of those in different bead colors and stuff like that. Number one and sizes, the more you can simplify the selection of the actual nymph versus, okay, which size, okay, I'm going to use a flashy pheasant tail or not. So um, for that base one, um, the, the ones I would, you know, silver is still worthwhile having, but, you know, silver, copper, pink, and a uh, pewter. That's it. Yeah. Like, I, and that's, that's the end of that. Uh, once I, the two I fish the most, pink and copper. Yeah. In that fly. Uh, those, pink is actually pretty subtle. So when you actually drop down, um, and by the way, after like five feet, all flies turn gray, <laughs> unless they're like florets and orange or green. So just so you know. Uh, but in a river, um, light, light conditions like the penetration of the light and the color of the water will really dictate the 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 fly choice i use it like in that like the grand or any of that kind of um tea colored water um a lot of times silver can be good that's why you can have them but that copper is just that standard go-to especially when it gets uh, bright and sunny in those clear clear waters it's just a really good one but you know the real basic one with a pewter or a, even a black bead you know for sure you're not going to spook any fish with that one um, one thing to pay attention to is the size of the bead. So I'm put, I'm, these are three mil or 2.8 mil. Um, you know, on that size 14, my range would probably be the max of 3.5. I wouldn't go any heavier than that down to maybe a two. Um, just be weary also of big beads make a big splash. So I see a lot of people will go to a really subtle colored nymph. <laughs> but have a honking bead on it in spooky water. Um, just make sure, you know, if you're fishing that kind of, if it's not fast riffles or fast water, a small little plunk is a, is an advantage. They'll see it and they'll move to it. A uh, big plunk can put them off. So uh, not many people spend a lot of time on what's the splash my nymphs are making. Yeah. Uh, that's a big game changer, especially for difficult fish. You'd be surprised. And again, plunk is good. Too big is bad. Sure. Um, so but, I'm just uh, doing what I did before, inverting the bead, boom, um, orange thread. I like when I tie Frenchies, I actually like the whole body to be orange. I, I figure I'm going, I'm all in now. Um, <laughs> I'm putting, a, I'm putting a hot spot on. If the fly gets chewed up a little bit, a little bit of that orange comes through. Uh, it's a real trick by the Czech, uh, for those who are competition anglers, the Czechs really like that. Um, their theory is, hey, if a fish is eating it, they're, they're on it. A little bit of orange coming through the body is pretty good. They do that on their lake flies as well. Hmm, so cool. same again, as they've seen, you know, so I've got. We had a, sorry, and I'll just can't cut yeah, just I'll let you Every, I'm just, as you mostly, talk, I'm just going to yeah. rip off a pheasant This is mostly here. the same, uh, same process, guys, watching. So I just wanted to get back to uh, Jim's comment here, asking if brass beads work. So, uh, I mean, brass beads are very rarely found in slotted varieties, so it would be a regular countersunk bead anyways. But the um, reason we really like tungsten, really advocate for it, is um, it, its density. You know, it's well over twice as dense as brass, and so it just sinks way faster. And also just keeps you in much better connection with your flaws, so you can really feel what's going on. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And then I think when you're getting into brass beads, I know like uh, my buddy George Daniel likes them um, for, you know, reducing the sink rate for when you're into water that's, yeah. um, you know, not as fast and stuff like that to monitor the sink rate. I actually just go down to a small tungsten bead and the other flying in a tie, old school wet fly. If I'm not worried about the sink rate, I'll just fish a wet fly yeah. like a nymph, you know, and that'll that'll work, too. Yeah. So then, what you uh, can't see when you tie this one with an orange, it gets a little bit of an orange. Kind of huge like you'll get a little bit the way I tie it. You can see a little bit of thread out the butt. I don't worry about it. Some, it's just got a little bit of an orange glow to it. As I said before, you don't have to do it that way. You can switch thread if you want. This is like the original fly called a Frenchie because the French team used it like 100 years ago in competitions and won them all the time. <laughs> the original Frenchie was this, this. So then you put a hot spot on it like that and you're done. So same like the other one, this is my fast water fly. It sinks faster. I have a bunch of those. I will put a little bit of glue on it uh, just so it doesn't unravel. But really on that piece, done. Totally done. The one I, I like, uh, so my version of adding then a little bit of the uh, the hairs there to it, you'll see a theme. So I just take hot orange uh, dub, dubbing. So, you know, this is hens. Use whatever you want. Um, so I like the the... Um, hot orange ice dub or whatever it's called. You'll yeah. know better than me, Chris, whatever that ice dub. So it's just That's ice a dub. sparkly cow orange dub in there. Hot orange, yeah. What What is it? Hairline hot orange dub or something like that? Uh, yeah, I, I this dub one, the, the equipment. So I'll do that, with, and I really like that one. Yeah. So good. that version, again, has a little more disco-ness to it, catches a bit more light. Uh, don't be afraid of these on bright days. So orange is a good uh, fly on bright days. Uh, that is a little more subtle than you think when it gets in the water. That's a that's a deadly pattern. Like I got a ton of confidence in that one. Uh, I actually fish it more than just the regular hot spot Frenchie. But if you fish the Grand or the Credit, this slays uh, in the right water. And again, if you're not catching on this, just take it off and go to the one that, that doesn't have that on it. So those are those are two staples. Anybody's been in my box, they'll know. And I that bad, that bad boy will, will get it done. To beat that. All right. Um, just one more uh, one other point. Um, so, sorry, you can hear me, still, Ian? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to throw out one other point, just because I thought about it as well. Um, we didn't, we haven't really addressed specifically. I mean, I think a lot of people here realize that uh, these flies are very much geared toward sort of Euro nymphing, tight line uh, nymphing techniques. You know, it's kind of uh, the competitive world when it comes to nymphing, at least. But these flies do work really well under indicators too. So even if you're an indicator guy, I would still really encourage anyone to try them out with like the inverted style, a jig hook or non, tungsten beads, because it, it still sure. gives you lots sure. of advantages. Like an inverted hook is still going to snag less. It's, you know, this style is still giving you more uh, hook point to work with to hook fish. And it allows you to use less split shot too. So even if you're an indicator guy, which is perfectly good, there's lots of advantages to indicators too. Um, maybe not quite as many as you're in a lot of cases, but, uh, there's still lots of pluses to, uh, to these. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, I would say, you know, a couple, you don't actually necessarily have to invert the bead, but, uh, I, I use indicators too. They work really, really well. These are great steelhead flies too. Steelhead or trout as well, or I'm not sure if they're technically what they land in between. <laughs> uh, they sort of act like a trout when they're in the water. Uh, these are, these are flies I'll put through for, um, for, for, for steelhead and also great lake flies. Yeah. So um, don't discount that basic pheasant tail on a lake, and I'll throw you another one. Really mess with you. Put some light tippet on and throw it as a streamer. Put two of these nymphs on, cast it across, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. If you have uh, on, the, on the grand one fly, <laughs> just cast it across and fish it downstream with little twitches. Um, like you said, you, you indicator, like people never think of fishing nymphs actively to that level. We talk okay. about jigging them and stuff like that. You'd be amazed how many fish you catch when it's active and it's the right conditions of just fishing them on, uh, you know, I fish them on a, on a Euro rig or even on my streamer rig. I'll just put on a, you know, a bigger one and just fish it through. It's not obtrusive to the fish. It just looks like a little moving. Yeah. Like if you look at tiny little minnows a lot of time, they, like they aren't, you know, big, uh, you know, things with tails flapping all about. They are kind of stick-like a lot of the time, so I could... Definitely... So the one I'm going to tie right now is the one I like to move fast. Okay, so cool. I'm funny how you said minnow, so thanks for <laughs> taking my thunder on that one. So it's like it's like a little minnow. It also fishes a lot like um, 
you know, for call it uh, caddis, actually. It only said these are all mayflies, but this one's got a little bit of sizzle to it, mm. and uh, it's a it's it's pretty pretty bright, uh, flashy. So, and when it comes to bead colors, silver fish can see the farthest. So everybody, you know, when they think of outside of using like a fluorescent neon or anything, always think the most aggressive bead color is actually usually silver. Gold gets a lot of press for it, um, but actually silver is the one that, and so in dark conditions or low light or dark water, I love a silver bead. And tea colored water, love a silver bead. Just right there. I could just tie that off and fish <laughs> and feel really comfortable with just a black body and a silver bead. Hey, it's almost like a zebra midge, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to rip one off here quick. So again, I'm just skipping over the, the actual tying of the fly here because you can just watch me tie the same one. But you can see you can rip them off pretty good. I've got three again. Tie it in. I think that three fiber thing is really key. Like, a lot of pheasant tails that you see tied, you know, in, um, you know, in fly shot boxes and stuff, they're, they have a little more taper to them than old bulkier. But the three fiber thing, like, you get a really nice thin profile. It's, thin, it's thin, great look. So two things, thin for the win, we would say, both in the leader and the flies. Um, you know, there's there are there is a time for the kind of, uh, morbidly obese fly, but I can't. It's not a pheasant tail, so I, it's a great point to call out. The only reason uh, you do, and again, I'm using more thin thread. Uh, I really want that body thin um, all the time. So, oops, I almost forgot because I never. Is, so I, you can use like you know small mirage tinsel, small pearl. I'm using that. I think it's called silky. Yeah, it's just but... a really really small pearl rib. So this one is a really uh, is a pheasant tail on steroids. So this would be not falling under the subtle piece. This would definitely fall under the aggressive side of things. I can't even, that's uh, in there somehow. <laughs> All right. So I won't, uh, let's just pretend I'm going to zap a gap that body. I won't do it. Um, so again, and zap a gap the body, wrap this around a couple times, get it on the thread. And the thread, this thread trick really does make the fly more durable with the the only pain in the butt with this one is the is the rib in the way for a second so off i go down the fly there i am so this this is a beaut so again that's what just a silver bead would look like again very very useful to have then you take your rib and i i aggressively rib this one so I want really close ribs, and it gives it a really cool effect. I might be able to get one more in there. Yeah, I can get one more in there. Okay. So that one, and then just leave it alone. <laughs> like, don't go adding a ton. <laughs> if you really are dubbing crazy and you just can't help yourself, like you just have to, take like a Hens 46, which is that green, or that black ice dub or something like a you know, a peacock curl dub that goes okay with it. I've, I've found that's a bit much. It'll work. Uh, but that one, you see when I move it, that gets a really good effect in the water. That's really subtle flash coming through that, but that's a really good one. You can do that with other bead colors. I just tend to like it with the silver. Very nice. And I would highly recommend that one, but that's a, and then this, this one pulled is fantastic. So this is a great active nymph. It's flashy rainbows lose their minds for that fly <laughs> uh and then the last one I, I won't tie the fly so let's just use all our imaginations and say i didn't rib it um you i would not do this with the ribbing but this is a great fly it worked really well for us in ireland when we were there uh for the commonwealths it's uh i know it's martin droz uh he's a multiple world champion one of his favorite flies um so uv pink iced up Check pink. It's like a soft pink, right? Yeah. Um, so standard with the silver bead is when I like this one. You take a little bit of that. And this is a really, I mean, browns and rainbows love it. I wouldn't exclusively, but I find, geez, I've done, except, uh, I've done well with this everywhere. So you just put a little bit of that at the front end of the fly and tie it off. That's yeah. probably a little aggressive. And so if you're going to do that. Maybe would about, not, maybe about that would much not of it. So not with the with the flashy because I think it's been much. So that gives a little bit of UV. That's actually really a subtle difference uh, on the fly. That sometimes will outfish just the regular silver bead one. Um, cool. That's a beauty. So those are my top standard pheasant tails that I, I wouldn't be without. And that's kind of all the ones I fish. 
So I know it. So I've kind of narrowed it down. It's not too many. It's really, and I've actually got a couple, like as I said, I've got some that I like with certain beads over other ones. There's no rules. Put other beads on them. Try them. There's times a gold bead will kill. Don't be afraid to try any bead. So that's the pheasant tail. Simple, fast, easy, and durable. Better, I, I find way more durable than the wire ones. Any questions on that one? No, uh, Scott was asking about the ribbing material, but uh, just get back to him. Just a, a small pearl tinsel. Yeah, I think this one's called silky or something like that. You know that? Whatever that is. I, I don't know. Somebody get it to me. It's really good. It's really thin. Uh, it's as thin as you can get. So, Chris, I don't know. Does it small or – There's um, is probably the this... smallest. I think we actually just got some more in that um, we've got around here. would be the um, the Uni um, Mylar in a size 16, which is like an extra small. It's it's pretty oh, okay. small. I think I've seen that. That's a good one. You have in. It's probably okay. pretty good. Terrible. All right. So the next one. Like I'm going vintage on this one, vintage. So uh, I, I, if you've been to my website or been out with me, like I was mentored by Ian Colin James. And for those who don't know who that is, he was very famous, one of the original guides in Ontario, Scottish guy, looked like Shrek, um, really instilled a lot of simplicity and, and took my fly fishing to and my guiding to another level. Uh, this was one of his favorite flies for sure. Um and this is the way you know I uh, I tied it from him. Uh, it's very similar to what we were just tied. So it's 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 a pheasant tail wet fly. It's super good. I actually like it in bigger sizes. So I like this in like if it, if there's big mayflies, I like tens. This is a 12, 14. I'm kind of done at fourteen. If I'm going to go to a sixteen wet fly, I'm probably just going to put thread on the body. I'm not going to bother, but this, this really is good in a 12 for the Hendrickson's and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll throw a couple of tips while I'm on how to fish it. it. You don't just have to do the old wet fly swing. Um, I actually prefer to fish this as an emerger in the top dead drift. So this is a great when the, when they're eaten just under the surface and they won't come up, uh, people forget about how, how good a, a greased wet fly can be. Yeah. It looks like, uh, and those who, you know, it, resembles a lot of things uh but fish have trouble uh not eating one of those um it, you can swing it for sure another you can twitch it you can uh, you can upstream dead drift it this is where the question on the brass beads this is a pretty heavy hook on that um which one you know if i'm mean? gonna if i'm gonna find i don't want weight i'm not really not gonna in a small tungsten's too much weight i want no weight um so this is a great one in those some of the slower water stuff like that never be afraid to upstream dead drift uh this fly it, you know it can fish it deeper uh but it can put some some powder on it put some gink put it in the film let it sink a little bit it looks like a cripple um cripple done and they pound it so it's which a good uh, fly sorry, for sure which i mean it's not was? new it's probably one of the oldest flies in the world <laughs> uh but it works uh so you know get some partridge uh yep sorry uh what, what hook did you say that was this was a uh, this is a Hannock 230 BL size 30 as well. Okay, but again, I, I mean, I just like it. It's a standard with it. I just yeah. like the turned up hook. Um, you know, watch the weight of the hook on this one. Yeah. Um, so you can tie this in. So much like the beads, if you really, you know, and then I would say, sorry, you can fish it on dry fly hook. Um, this is a medium wire hook, best of both worlds, and then a heavy wire hook. Um, you'll be amazed at how fast a fly will sink with a heavy wire hook. Um, the tip on that one, because you don't have the beads to kind of go, well, that's heavier than another, just change the thread color. So you'll you'll have one with a red head, one with a yellow, and one with a black. Oh, the black heads are on my heavy wire hooks. My yellows are on my dry fly hooks. Fish don't care. And then you can just grab it right away. Uh, that's getting pretty technical. I don't bother. Medium wire It'll grease up. It'll go down. I just leave it. Um, so I just take a chunk of, uh, what, what is that, partridge, whatever you want, kids want to call these days. Um, <laughs> I, and so I actually tie the tail. Some people won't do that. This is where my Band-Aid's in the way. But I've taken a chunk and made a little tail. So I don't actually use the pheasant tail as the tail. Hmm. And Chris is going to say, why is that? Uh, awesome. Good question, Chris. Uh, two reasons. I was taught this way but the second one is it actually has more movement yeah so this is one where i'm not tumbling it along the bottom i like uh, i'm not using cock de leon it's too stiff if i'm swinging it it gets a little bit more movement you can omit the tail as well like there's nothing wrong with this fly and you'll see them tied online where they just leave that part out i just like it 
So I'm curious I have no idea if it works better one way or the other. I just like it. Yeah. I'm curious as well, Ian. Um, I know it's sort of um, um, a theory of some guys that you know more natural cat flies. I, I assume this is going to become a, a fairly kind of drab fly. You know, more natural stuff go larger sizes, brighter stuff a little smaller. What do you think of that? How do you mix that into your? Sorry, you just your um, your your uh, audio what? broke up there. I didn't catch it. Yeah. So I know some it? guys like to think um, you know more natural kind of drab flies, which I assume this is going to be. Uh, you know, little larger yep. sizes, brighter stuff, smaller sizes. Do you adopt that that theory? It's not a bad idea. Uh, like uh, I've I've never thought of that theory. I, I I would say I don't. I most of my flies in a river yeah. are 14s and 16s. To be honest, and when I get into the 12s, you actually do tend to be more natural. Um, but I, it's just because when you're you're putting too much flash on, it's just a lot going on. But out in Vancouver Island, like I was using really flashy size 12s and 10s, and they were they would outfish the natural. <laughs> so yeah. I think it uh, depends on the situation. Are they wild fish? Are they stock fish? Are they aggressive fish? Are they hammered fish? Like you really, um, I I say take a that you know have everything, try it. The yeah. fish will tell you. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't rule out anything, but if you're again start flashy, if that's not working, take the same fly, go natural. But this one's pretty pretty natural because I'm more fishing it. Um, I would say more, I fish this way more as almost like an emerger than a sw I don't swing a ton of wets, but swinging wets definitely, definitely works. Um, but I don't go too flashy when I swing wet flies. Sure. No idea why I should try it. Um, so I just cut the tail off tying it in because it's just reverse. Cause I don't have a tail going out the other side. Uh, same, same story. I don't rib this one either. Uh, <laughs> no need. So make it durable. This is the boring part. I just do this. this is the end of me doing these types of flies, so don't worry. We're going to get uh, – so, again, wrap it around a couple of times. If you don't cut your fr fr uh, thumb into a French fry, you can just wrap it like that. Then we go. So, you can – if you have a vise that spins, you can just pump these things out. So, leave some room at the front. The good news, though, with the glue is I that slipped out of my hand, it's, and it's it didn't there. go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, so, I that's, that's the that's other the, benefit of doing that. So, you know, you get there at the end – and that fly would have just unraveled. I'm just going to chunk it out here. Um, and stuff like this, this is what a fly looks like after a fish has eaten it but a bunch of times, and they still work. But uh, never sweat it if they get a little rough. Like some of my pheasant tails, when I tie them, look like garbage. I know in one fish they're going to look a little bit like garbage. They sometimes fish better uh, when they get hacked up. But I saved it. Life is good. First thing I'm going to blame is my thumb. But there you go. All right. So kind of like the other one, just got a tail on it. Then I'm going to take, uh, just like everybody's seen, you know, take that, pull the fibers back. This should be fun with my Band-Aid. <laughs> and that being a partridge feather, just in case it wasn't clear. That's a partridge feather. Well, well marked. <laughs> um, and it's really for the softness. It's your standard wet fly. Yeah. I'm tying it in at the, the tip. And this is one where I don't, you know, if you're into North Country spiders from from England, which are the original ones, they would do like two wisps of a turn and say it's overdressed. Um, this one I tend to overdress a bit because I, I again I, I actually want it to fish up. Yeah. If I want it on the bottom, uh, I'll probably fish a nymph anyways. Yeah. Um, and if I'm swinging it, it's got a pretty heavy hook. It's good enough because it's not small. So again, so I'm just going to give this. I didn't bring my hackle pliers from downstairs, which is a mistake right now, but. Uh, just a couple wraps. If you know, don't lose your mind. If you've, gee, is it two and a half wraps versus three? Who cares? Uh, if you're happy with it, fish it, pull them back. Right. So I'm happy with that. Get rid of the stem. Some people get very, very snooty around wet flies. So there. So I, I fish mine like that. So that's a buggy fly, right? So um, there's a, I love the movement of it. You know, there are people who will stick a bead in front of that too. And so that's not a bad mm -hmm. fly either. That's a lot, a lot of movement, that bigger sizes. So, you know, put your, put your flashy bead on it, push, put a, just a standard bead on it. I don't do that. I know that's a pretty successful pattern for some people, but again, if I'm going to put it on the, I just kind of went, if I'm going to fish a nymph, I've narrowed my, 
kind of my selection. I just fish this as a wet fly. Um, this is also not to say this won't work well in a lake. You can easily fish this as a, for those who do lake fishing. If there's midges coming off or anything like that, this works really, really well. So really basic pattern, forgotten about pattern in a lot of people's boxes. Um, again, if I turn it like that, that looks just like a, a cripple. A fisher up at, near the surface. Don't forget about the wet fly. Yeah. Cool. I like fish there's pump. that one. Ooh. Yep, there we um, go. <laughs> uh, all right. And my last in my river series, so this would be it for my river flies. And this probably the greatest dry fly ever developed. <laughs> if if I could only use one dry fly outside of a, okay, for a caddis, it would be this. Uh, so it's a fly called the plume tip. Um, Jeremy Lucas, um, who's a famous competition angler in the UK, uh, developed it. If you're wondering how many dry flies he fishes, and he's considered one of the best dry fly fishermen in the world, one, this pattern, maybe two, one called an Opo, uh, and then maybe one called a championship caddis, three, I guess. But uh, he's so convinced, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not wrong. Um, if a fish won't eat this, just go to a smaller size. So, but that this, again, I should say for, this is much for your midge feeders. You know, those little sipping trout you see in the slow water, you should go plume tip time all the time. It's not a great fast water fly. That's where your, your elk hair caddises and stuff like that are better, your CDC caddises and stuff. And we'll tie some of those on the CDC night. Uh, but this one, I know it's a, I, I, I waffled on, does this go in CDC night or, or pheasant tail night? I'm putting it in pheasant tail night. Um, really simple pattern, deadly. Um, like to the point, you know, if you get a good drift over fish, they're probably going to eat it. If they don't go one size down, if they won't eat that, go second size down then go home because it's not a fish there. They're cast. I don't know what you're casting to. Um, but they'll, if there's our fish, this is not a great, I would say searching pattern as much as it's, you see fish on the dries. Um, they're in, in that kind of back eddies, that slower water. You know what I'm talking about. Um, anytime you see a fish kind of sipping the like grand, you see that big snout come out, pull this out for sure. Like first fly. Um, and you're not, it's a great fly. And I'm going to start tying it now. So this is where I use, I'm using olive thread. This is um, like 14-0, like thin. Um, you really want thin thread for this fly. You can use like a pale yellow and give it a little bit different look. Um, it, the sky's not going to fall if you have black or whatever. I just like olive. Um, you'll see, because we do actually wrap the thread a little bit on the body, you can change. The original has a yellow, like he uses that pale yellow. Um, I like the olive, but uh, no big deal. Um, so this is a four, size 14 dry fly foot hook. This is the biggest I would tie it. So I don't tie this bigger. If I'm using big dries, it's not this one. Um, and then a, I tie a, a 16 and an 18. He goes down to a 20. I'm like, eh, screw it. I don't know how to wrap it. He, he, he uses heron hurl uh, instead of peacock hurl. His original was peacock hurl. Um, he has... You know, if you get his one book called Presentation Fly Fishing, which is a really good one, it's a very advanced book, but it's a good one. I mean, it's got like four chapters probably on the plume tip. But he said, uh, moving between a hair and hurl, which we can't get here, uh, and or at least I don't think we can get here, and a pheasant tail makes absolutely no difference on the fly. So he just has it abundant where he is. And he's, I've, I would, I mean, it works so well the way it is. I can't see that making a difference. So, all right. So super thin thread right down to the bend of the hook. Again, I'm going kind of full, full body here. And I'm going to keep using that fly. We're cannibalizing it here. So again, I like three is the magic number. Um, so what I'm going to do again is I just take, take the tips, clip them. We're, there's no tail on this fly. I wrap it on the body because the one thing that is annoying when you tie this fly, sometimes you'll break off just when you start wrapping because I do try to keep it thin, but it is annoying sometimes. So we might break it off today. So I just wrap the, I wrap the pheasant tail in first. You don't have to do that. You can start with the wing, but, and it, I'm not going down the bend of the hook. So I'm not trying to curve it down. I'm, I'm using a standard dry fly hook. It's not one of those curved clink hammer style straight body. I think it matters. It sits because it's going to—it's how it sits in the water that I think makes most of the difference, to be honest. Um, so then I get get your favorite CDC bag of CDC, um, and this is an interesting one. So there's a lot of debate on how many feathers to use. Um, 
the the guy who invented the fly goes really light on CDC. Like he would go two feathers for this, one for all his other ones. Um, I, I, I get his point on overdressing it. I find it, I get a little more floatability with three. So I'll go three good quality CDC feathers. Uh, four is getting a bit much. So three for this one, two for uh, 16 and one for an 18. So you can see I've just stacked them up like this. I've got them all even at the top. I wouldn't get to, you know, you, you could say, okay, I want them co like concave or convex or whatever. I want them to just kind of splay out. I wouldn't lose sleep over it. But if you really want it, I like them splayed out versus splayed in. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want them to be soft at the tips. There's no stem sticking out or anything like that. So it's a lot like a shuttlecock, right? So length of the fly. Whoop, bring a thread to the front. So I'm going to tie that in at the, at the eye of the fly, right? Yeah. Next, take your Good. scissors. Key point, cut at an angle. So you want to cut it at this angle because this is kind of going to be your thorax. Don't cut your fez tail. Um, right. So, um, by the way, this fly tied just with a thread body, also awesome. Um, so you can skip the pheasant tail piece if you're really lazy uh, or you want a really thin fly. So I'm just going to latch that in. You can see it's a little bit wider at the end and you got this kind of shuttlecock thing happening there. Uh, enter our, our pheasant tail, but wait, you're not gluing it. I know crazy times <laughs> and I'm not, and I'm just wrapping it, not on my thread going old school. So I just wrap it up. You could put uh, glue if you really want to on this one. I don't bother. I go here cause we're going to wrap down the body. So I've got that. Ooh, almost lost it. <laughs> got lucky there. So I got that wrapped up. Okay. Trim it. Okay. And this, so take, this is why you want thin thread. This, then down the body in big wraps and then come back up and don't go overboard. It really, you know, you think, oh my God, I'm crumpling all the pheasant tail fi fibers. Nah, just gives a little bit of a green underglow. When wet is just dark, doesn't really matter. It just makes it super durable. I tried that on the pheasant tail nymph. I hated the way it looks. Hmm. This is so thin. It looks looks good. It works. The last part, uh, two things we're going to do. Take your CDC feathers, grab a clump of what's left over. This is a little difference. He, he doesn't necessarily use the CDC all the time. He uses sometimes just hair's ear. Uh, I like the CDC myself for, I'm just dubbing that on, for extra floatability. And it's all leggy. So it gives it a nice little thorax in behind it. So it looks like that pull all this forward and come in behind the hook eye. And this is the key part of the fly. You want that actually to stand up a little bit. You see how it's not a straight, oops, that's a nice fly line, how it's a straight shuttlecock. It's got the wing coming off about like that. Yeah. So think about it. That's going to sit in the water with the body about like that. That's where the magic happens on this fly, I think. Uh, but, oh my, see, I want to eat that right now. Uh, and you're done. And so... A lot of times on my flies, I'll put little pieces of, you know, uh, glow bright floss and stuff. This, these up wing flies are pretty easy to spot. They're not, they're not too hard to, to find. Uh, if you really wanted to, you could tie in a little hot spot to stick up above the wing, but I, I don't bother with it. It's pre it's pretty easy to find. And, and if you can't find it, when you're getting down to, I mean, you're not going to find many flies when you're fishing a, an 18. So you just kind of. You know, if you get a fish moves, lift your rod. So can you see that okay, Chris? Yeah, that's beautiful. That is a, I mean, I'm telling you, that is a deadly, de deadly dry fly. <laughs> All right, so that's that bad boy. And here's one I tied earlier, like one of those cooking shows. Ooh, look at that, I was tying them. Uh, so my box would be full of those. Um, uh, story in New Zealand, um, we were fishing. Um, I mean, the rivers there are insane and the, the North Island, I would say the fish are overly picky, except for in this stupid moth that I won't talk about because they'll go into a tirade of how hard they were to catch. Uh, but you had really big rainbows and browns midging, right? And they were hard to catch uh, for some reason. Um, the top, I mean, the fly that just destroyed them was an 18 uh, plume tip. Like every cast, outfished every fly. Um, I wasn't surprised. As soon as I saw that behavior, I tried other flies. Nope. Uh, we thought they were eating that moss. We were fishing caddis. Nope. Tried every other small fly. Nope. I'm like, of course, plume tip. Boom, right away. 
Um, <laughs> so really, really good Basics. fly. Nice. Okay, that's my river section. I'm going to go into kind of my lake, my lake stuff now. Any questions on the river stuff before we switch into still water mode? Doesn't look like it. If anyone does have anything, um, you know, if they wanted to, to clarify there, drop a comment. We can always backtrack to it. But okay, all right, that sounds great. Okay, I'm gonna keep keep it old school, and then we're gonna go modern. So all right. It does not get more old school than this. I guarantee you, Chris has a couple in his box. <laughs> this is called a cove pheasant tail, or uh, cove buzzer, whatever you want to call it. It's a guy named Arthur Cove. If you don't know who he is, he's a fly fishing legend in the UK from the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, he invented straight line buzzer fishing. No big deal. <laughs> um, he's a, His book, My Way with Trout, it's like from the 60s. Yeah. You'll be amazed if you read it. It's, it's, he's really good. Uh, he liked himself a bit, but he was really <laughs> good. Um, this was his top fly that he used everywhere, and they, we, it's still regularly in use today. So this would be your chronomid if you're – I guess from where we are from here, uh, call it a buzzer. If there's anybody on the line from BC, uh, Tunqua, all those, uh, you know, they, they, the, the British team won the world championships in BC in 1993. Uh, they fished this fly, single fly, on a long leader and beat everybody who was pulling woolly buggers, right? So there's lots of great buzzer patterns. There's lots of great epoxy buzzer patterns. This is a real standard staple um and a fantastic fly uh for it's all the same reasons we talked about before it's simple but it really really works yeah love it so um and it's start off because we've missed on the last couple hook what's that oh this is a size 12 hannock uh, buzzer or, okay. so uh so heavy wire yeah. uh that's great call out chris so you could use your kind of scud hooks and all that kind of stuff i just like a bit heavier wire and you want that curvature in it um so um Anything you call a, you know, with a curve in it, like scud hook, hook check, you know, hook. even those Raven old, you know, is, <laughs> but the wire in this I like is, is heavier wire. And that's just for sinkability. I fish this slow, like I'm putting this on an 18 foot leader on the point with three flies, uh, you know, across it, probably five, six feet apart. This is usually my point fly. So I tie this in tens and twelves. I don't go really much Eight. smaller than that. Um, sometimes eights. So if you're fishing in Lake Ontario, um, steelhead will, at the mouth, eat buzzers. Uh, these are pretty good flies in bigger sizes. And if you see like those, sometimes you get those huge buzzer hatches where they're big. A 12, if I had to fish one, would be a 12. That's kind of your standard for our lakes here. Works really, really well. Um, so thread doesn't really matter. I'm going back to the black. This, this sucker's easy. Again, like most of my flies. So... Thread base, touching turns, all the way down. Now we want the bend. It's a bend, you know, take it as far down as you kind of dare. Don't go crazy all the way around, but a good bending is what you want. Um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna rib this sucker, so I'm not going to do it my other way. Uh, I'm, I stick to the traditional, but I will uh, put the, the glue on it because this sucker gets chewed up. Silver wire, you could use copper. I don't really care. <laughs> like I, I, I like a silver wire just because midges kind of have that silvery glow uh, to them. Um, you could use a copper. I would stick with silver myself. But so I'm just wrapping in the silver wire. Grab a pheasant tail. You can be a little more liberal with this one, like crazy, like going for four, um, <laughs> four or five. So you can see I've grabbed a little bit bigger chunk here. Uh, you, you, it's a, it's okay to have a little bit thicker body here. So I'm going to tie that in by the tips if I can. So catch it in, tie it in, right down the body. Nice even body all the way down. All right, right, and then back up to about here because we're like you've stopped your thread, not right to the eye because we're actually going to put a, a, a we'll call it a wing case on it. Um, so I am going to glue this down. You catch a lot of fish in this. The only the only downfall would be durability, not fish catching ability. You don't really lose many of them. You do get them chewed up pretty good though. Yeah. Unlike so, a fly, which is uh, oh. I'm I'm I that glue and yes, I could do the thread thing again. I just because I'm putting wire on it, I don't bother. Nothing stopping you from doing that. So keep this piece. Don't trim it. You're gonna need it. Um, you can counter rib. This fly, I'm not convinced that makes any difference. <laughs> I've just glued it. Um, do whatever you want. Um, 
I like one turn on the on the base before I go up the fly and then progressively getting farther apart. So I don't wrap it evenly. Fish difference, zero. The way I like the way the fly looks, it gives it a cool segmented look like it's got a bend to it. I guarantee you that makes absolutely no difference. Uh, it's just the way I like it. Um, you could wiggle this wire off. It's so thin, I'm just gonna cut it. So as you can see, there's just a little bit of a silver glow there. Now this is where you can do a couple variations. I'm gonna do the original, which the original was the really soft dark under fur from a hair's mask. He didn't like the spiky. I like the spiky. Ian James, this is he fished this on the river all the time on the Grand with a split shot under an indicator. It's a great river fly. It was one of his top steelhead flies under an indicator. So there's nothing that says you can't fish this as a river fly. Um, but I like it a little spiky. I like the movement. The other variations are pearl rib because it gives you that, you know, you just fish it as a pearl rib. And then the other one, you can put like an ice dub hotspot on it. Uh, the orange is pretty good. Choose your favorite. But a real common one is the pearl rib. It gives you that glint, right? So it's a really good one. But I'm going to tie the original right now. So again, I've just taken a chunk of spiky. Um, this is, I think, uh, like fox squirrel or something like that. Um, you could just use hair's ear. Again, I wouldn't overthink it too much. I just like a good little spiky body on that. That's about, so it gives it that buzzer look and feel. Pull the wing case over. Pull that the fur back, tie her in. Oh, Insta yeah, kill. look at that baby. All right, <laughs> um, that is a great fishy fly. Oh, sell, like, not fish that much in Canada. Um, a classic in the UK um, and one to not be forgotten. Like, I just give it, give it the respect it deserves. It, it stood the test of time. Uh, I mean, it's a pheasant tail. It's going to work, but that's a great buzzer pattern. I don't know how that comes through on that, on the, on the, well. but you can see how fishy that's that the, is. I'll hold that up. Pretty interesting too. That's, pr think... that's a pretty fishy, <laughs> pretty fishy fly. You see it up close, right? Yeah, it really is. I think if I remember right, wasn't uh, Cove a friend of Frank Sawyer's as well? I don't know. How old's Frank Sawyer? Uh, a little older, but I think they actually bumped into each other, cross paths in the, the UK. I remember oh. reading Cove's book. Uh, and for those you know, know uh, Frank Sawyer, inventor of the pheasant tail nymph. <laughs> so, wow. Oh, yeah, in interesting. Uh, okay. Didn't know it. There. Yeah. Um, well, possibly. I will not. I, I, I think I might be misremembering. That, uh, piece. I might I be. sure know that a cove nymph or cove buzzer is a, is a good one and still fish today by top, top still water anglers. Um, the next one is a, as, as a, is a, is a favorite of mine, a uh, fly called the cutthroat cr cruncher. That's so there's original the original fly is called a cruncher. This variation is called the cutthroat cruncher. I love it. Um, what am I gonna do it in? Eh, let's go let's go big just for fun. So for most still water, I like tens and twelves. Let's do a ten. Do I have any tens here? Oh uh, yeah, I got nymph ten. So this is this is just a hen's ten hook. It looks the same. Choose your favorite wet fly hook. Um, again, I think this is would this would be a medium wire. I'm more concerned with the wire. Yeah, it's that's a medium wire. Uh, if you want to, if you tie this with a heavier wire, it's going to sink faster. Um, a lot of times, I fish this as a top dropper or a middle dropper. If you fish multiple flies, nothing that says you can't fish this as a single fly. So, uh, world champion uh, Ian Barr, who won years ago, uh, he's one of the I say one of the top stillwater anglers in the world. This is one of his all-time favorite flies, uh, and it works really, really well. Um, thread color indifferent. I'll stick with black. And if you type in cruncher on your browser, I'm sure you'll get about a bunch of variations. It's like a doll uh, fly, but this one is a good one. This is like uh, when I fish crunchers, 90% of the time it's this fly. The other one I tie is just the OG, which is just, well, you can guess when we go through it. Um, so I'm going to grab, what's that, Chris? Just cheap brown hackle, like hen? Uh, yeah, like a barred badger, like a brown hackle. A brown hackle. Brown yeah. hackle. <laughs> uh, so again, doesn't really matter. Just a brown or a badger hackle or anything like that. Um, the hackle, I, I like. I like the brown for this. You'll see some tied tied with the lighter color for more contrast, but that's just a brown yeah. hackle. Um, so we're gonna grab just some of the. Oops. 
So you're going to usually trim some. So yeah, just going to grab a few fibers off the the end of the feather there. Yep. So again, we're not tying the pheasant tail in as the tail on this one. Again, it's a little bit like that uh, wet fly I tied. It has the soft and it's back to the movement um, about the length of the body, maybe a little shorter. But so you can see that sticking out the, the butt. That's about as short as I would go on that because a 10 is pretty big. Uh, if I had to pick one size, it'd be a 12. I'm just, this is an easy one to see. All right. I will use a wire on this one. Red. Um, if I'm ever going to use wire, like for silver or red with my pheasant, it's really to to catch light and do something. This this does give the fly a little bit more red glow. We are going to put the cutthroat on it, which is a little bit more red around it. Red, as you guys all know, is a great color for fish. It's a great color for steel still water fishing for sure. Um, it diffuses when you get deeper, but a lot of times. If you're fishing a cruncher, they're eating. These are feeding oh, well, fish. It's um, a, more of a natural uh, with a bit of with a bit of flash on it. Um, this is really for a fish as an imitative pattern. While it's got a little bit of flash to it, it is still imitative. You could actually put this a bunch of cove uh, uh, as a top dropper uh, with a cove nymph. Um, I like hackled flies on my top droppers because they sink slower while my other one's going deeper, and it just allows me to fish different layers. Yeah. So wire, tie it in. Nothing fancy about that. Oh, our fly's getting eaten up. <laughs> it's, it's seen better days. <laughs> okay. Again, I go a little meatier with this one. Four, not like eight, <laughs> you know, but four or five. Uh, I'm okay with a little. Again, it's a lake pattern. It's not uh, and it's a that fly thin that river fish. fly we need. It's a fly you're gonna fish higher up too, right? So you don't. Yeah, it. higher up. It's a little meaty. It's not. I mean, we say it's still pretty thin. We're yeah. not going overboard on it here. Uh, I mean, I went to four uh, fibers. I again, you're not. I'm gonna glue it again. Problem with pheasant tail flies is durability. I keep saying that. Um, I don't do that thread wrap because I'm gonna rib it again. So you can see that that you know the only time I do that thread trick is when I'm not going to rib the fly. So kind of my pheasant tail nymphs for the river. Uh, give yourself a little bit more space because you're going to put the cut throat in the front there. We'll see in a moment. So that's glued. That makes a big difference. The glue, I'll keep saying it. I don't counter rib. I just, but again, I'm a little bit close with the ribs because I'm kind of trying to get flash. I don't think it's the segmentation or anything like that. That just gives it a little bit of a red glow in the water. I'll trim that too, just because my thumb. Okay. And then uh, holographic tinsel, sure. red. Uh, or medium, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. So catch medium. that in. This is, you know, oops. Try to catch that in. Okay. So I, I go over the body a little bit and come back. And then I'm just going to give it a couple wraps right over top of itself. That little bit makes a big difference. So that, that I think, like, again, a regular cruncher is good. Much like, you know, if the fish went off of this, then I would go to a natural cruncher. Just So picture a natural cruncher, no red rib, regular copper rib or silver rib. No cutthroat cruncher. Uh, it's almost like the wet fly we tied. And then we're going to take back our feather. That's right here. Chris says it's brown hen. I believe him. I think it's um, not, not hen, though. That's not hen. What is it? That's rooster, for sure. It's too stiff. Oh, badger or something, whatever you said? Yeah, okay. badger is just a, a brown hackle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, the right. just the, the fibers. Be I, go to the, I go to the fly tying expert, Chris, for <laughs> materials. Um, so brown hackle tied in, you know, this again, um, a little more dense. So again, for all you, if you're from Northern England right now and you're like, no, we tie one wispy turn, stop there, go for it. <laughs> uh, I pull these fibers back as I'm wrapping it and I go for like maximum, I don't know if it's a word, maximum wrappage. <laughs> um, so as many as I can kind of fit in there. I want this thing to push some water. Like sure. it, it's not that it has to, you know, I'm not worried. Again, this is You're that thinking. lower sink rate. I like that. Um, I like those fibers pulled back. 
This is sort of an alternative, I guess, for you to like something like a, a snatcher or a, a dabbler or something like that was more kind of bushy traditional flies. It's going to push a little more water, get noticed. Yeah, if I like, I would I fish a dabbler fast to push water. This is just going to hold the fly up. I see. Um, it sinks a bit slower. It's got movement. Um, I like the density of it, and then uh, it's going to it's going to sink just slower, right? Whereas I take that hackle, um, one turn a hackle versus three turns makes a difference so you can you know but uh, again it's how far down the rabbit hole do you want to get i kind of do two or three um i like the way that looks that's good enough for me um off you go cutthroat cruncher great middle fly so if you're those who fish three flies on a lake um that's one of my favorite middle droppers um between two blobs awesome uh stuff like that nice uh scott was asking uh, about how you fish that fly so i guess i mean if it was in a team of of buzzers or cromids i mean you wouldn't be fishing very fast um no. so mainly slow yeah like so it's much more of a natural fly but if uh for if, if scott has a question so depend like if i put it in, if i don't know what's going on on a lake uh, i'll start with like the real classic a blob if you know what that is on the top dropper for everybody something like this in the middle which is much more imitative. And then like uh, some type of bugger, woolly bugger, something called a vampire leech or something like that on the point. Um, and then I'll fish it on probably a fast glass line, which is called a fast a fly that fishes a line that sinks about a one and a half inch to two inches per second or a three inch per second. I just don't know where the fish are depth wise. And if they want to fly moved or they want naturals. So I'll usually cast that out and just vary my retrieves dead slow move it fast you know if i start picking up fish on this cruncher in the middle and it's dead slow well okay that off comes off my other stuff now i'm going to go natural and if i was choosing to fish this the way i would do i would put this more on my top dropper or a middle um but if i you know if i had uh, and then i would put uh a, another type buzzer in the middle choose your favorite and a cove on the point or something like that and i would cast that on a floating line and just almost keep up with it like straight, just let it sit there. Midges yeah. don't do that much. Uh, the once in a while, you can pull pull your line. I'm doing a big learn. It'll pull it up in the water because they wiggle up. Let it and then let it Make fall back down. Drop. So they see midges all the time. Sit there in the water, go back down, move back up, go back down. Um, that uh, that fly really does imitate a closer to the surface an emerging buzzer, but they'll eat it like you put this on a die seven line, which is right on the bottom, they'll still eat it. Uh, it's a great, just kind of all purpose, natural fly. I'll also stick it between two really flashy flies. Mm -hmm. So a blob again, like a real bright blob, like, to, you know, they're far apart, but this is in the middle. The blobs are there to bring the fish in. Maybe they'll eat it, maybe they won't. They might go, oh, that's a little much. I, didn't, I don't know if I needed a disco ball. Uh, that doesn't look like food to me. They'll turn and see the natural and they'll take it almost every time um that's a really good fly for that too yeah that's a couple of ways i i fish that but uh, anytime i thinking imitative it's one that'll come out sure. for sure um ian bars likes fishing it dead static like so he 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 fishes this really really slow uh pattern but you can see if i hold that up whoop, that's a pretty pretty sweet fly yeah uh, a lot of confidence in that fly and someone would ask well couldn't you put some red holographic tinsel on your wet fly Yep, good observation. Uh, if you're going to do that, put it at the butt, like if you're oh. swinging. Another variation I didn't show you on that one. No rib, just put the little a couple ribs of red is tinsel, that, and now you get a bit of a flashy wet fly. So is that the the positioning difference? Is that because if you're swinging, you're working down to yep. fish, and they see the butt yep. first? Totally. Okay. And that that's a swinging fly. That's not yeah. my cripple in the surface. That's a swinging fly. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite wet flies on the Grand. Uh, any wet fly just has a little bit of a red rib, uh, red butt, and it's a hundred percent. If I'm going to swing, it gives that little. It's coming to them this way now, so it gives them that little shot. Whereas a nymph's coming at them with the hot spot in front. Yeah. Cool. Now, I'm sure this would work with it in front, but I love the I love a cruncher. So that's a cruncher. Very nice. Any questions on that? Nope, just the one from Scott there. I think we addressed that pretty okay. well. So yeah, again. Now we're gonna get crazy. UK hopper. I'm gonna do a ten oh. as well. So, can't wait. This this is an all-purpose fly. Um, I love this fly. Um, it's one of my favorite lake dry flies for sure. Um, you can fish it as a dry fly. You can fish it static, kind of sunk. You can pull it. It's like an all-purpose. It looks like 
a big chronomid. It looks like a damselfly. It looks like anything a trout wants to eat. It's it's like one of the top. It is probably the top uh dry fly pattern or one of the tops used overseas in the uk it's absolutely deadly here it's really really good also works for bass by the way bass love it um (laughs) for those uh bass anglers out there so we're going to use knotted pheasant tail so i stayed up all last night tying this into (laughs) little knots and uh that's why i'm looking a little sleepy um, you can do this yourself if you want, and you. I guess it's COVID. We got time on our hands. Yeah. Um, for those that terrible. you know, t- tie in knotted pheasant tail. If you can see that. Yeah. Um, some poor person had to just sit here and tie those. Uh, people like tying them themselves. It's not going to be me. Um, so you can buy this knotted already. Yeah. Knotted pheasant tail is the one that's worth the price of admission yeah. um, because the fact that somebody ties little knots and all the end. I used to tie them myself for, for sure. You take two pieces and tie a little knot. Yeah, I used to do one for every fly, and then I realized I'm just going to buy some knotted pheasant tail. Yeah. So uh, I don't know, Chris, do you guys uh, order we're, this in or can you get actually, this? Uh, it's funny you bring it up because we're actually working on bringing some in right now. So hopefully oh, cool. we'll right. have some. But you can do it yourself, yeah. as I mentioned. Like, I, I tie it myself. Um, yeah, see, it was a, see, like, Chris, Chris, it's a home tie. I asked Chris to tie you some pheasant tail. Oh, please don't. So please don't. How do you I, tie I would buy it, it really carefully? Is it, I used to do it. I just don't anymore. Yeah. But if you can see that, if I move that up, it how much that looks great. like little legs. Oh, yeah. So that's going to form the legs and, and, and really a crumpled look on this fly. Yeah. Um, and this is a fly that has tons of variations to it. Um, you could go to town on it. I'll tie kind of one of the the originals i still still think it's the best um this is this i had i don't mind in a 10 so i fish this a lot in a 10 10s and 12s i don't go small with this one um you could go eight in some situations no problem um it's a great big fly uh in any shape of the uh, i don't fish it much on rivers i don't know why they're i don't know why uh it should work. Uh, I just don't. Uh, outside of bass, we'll eat it like it's going out of style. But uh, for my trout flies, I just have confidence in other things. I don't think we have. I guess we have a lot of grasshoppers. You could probably. It's called a hopper. Um, you could tie it. I don't know if it was originally made to imitate a a, a grasshopper. I think it's more. Um, they have something called daddies over there. Those blow in the water. They're like really big chronomids. Um, one of my other favorite flies is called a foam daddy. Uh, but this one. Uh, it just works across the spectrum so it's a pretty easy one to tie so this one i actually take it the thread right to where the hook's actually going to start to bend so this is a uh to size 10 dry fly hook so pretty big um i take it right to the bend uh as you can see there i like a little bit of curvature down i don't want to tie this fly too short because we're going to stick legs on and hackle on a bunch of stuff uh and it's a little more involved um so uh the the one i like to tie it with a seal's fur body you don't have to uh seal's fur is magic on a lake right so it's give you if you put a little gink on it it'll sit in the film when it goes in the water it grabs bubbles it's translucent it's amazing uh as a, as a lake pattern uh base so i'm using some black seals for my favorite colors for this are black red and orange uh but you can tie it in all of mix and match you could use hairs your body you could use a dubbing body they won't float as well but you could do it uh, but the black is always a classic because it gives a great silhouette on the top and you know as a you know the old saying, use any color as long as it's black, still kind of holds true. Um, so I grabbed a chunk of seals fur here. Um, like many people, seals fur doesn't dub that well. So this is where I'll bring a little dubbing wax out and put it on the thread. Seals fur can be a bit of a pain, but we'll get through it. Uh, oh, let's test the thumb. Thumb <laughs> thumb, and dubbing seals fur. Here we go. Let's see if I can get Impressive. it. Impressive. Ah, that's good enough. So I've just dubbed some black. Seals for some people will put a mono rib on it, get some, I don't know, 6X, 5X. If you're going to do that, chew it a little bit because you can catch it in and it won't slide through. And then you could rib it. Uh, I don't care if this fly gets scruffed up. I don't find, I find it super durable. I just don't bother with it. So seals for it's, you know, it's going to be like messy and spiky. Don't care. So I do really, I'm almost over wrapping it. 
You can see that. Like I, I like this fly a little chunky. And it's again, seals first pretty translucent when we get through it. And that also when I pull it out a little bit, I can gink that up and it'll float under the water. Float it's gonna yeah. look super buggy. Right. So I could probably throw probably got about a little third bit of your hook shank free still there. And again, you don't have to fish this as a dry fly. Fish this at a anything you want fly. And we'll go from there. I, I'm just I just kind of under underdid it there. So there we go. Okay. So there's our body. No rib, no nothing. Awesome. Hand tied by Chris. Get your, get your <laughs> pheasant tail. So um, you just grab a clump, clump of about two or three um, of these. You know, some people really argue two versus three. I go two a lot of time, two clumps, just because I don't want to use them up and I don't think it really matters. But that looks like that. That's so four or five. See all of a sudden there's like, what do you got, like four or five legs in there? Yeah. So I just take one or two clumps, put it on this side. Uh, maybe a bit much. I'm going to go two. That was three in there. So take two. If you can, it don't lose sleep over it. If you want it angled down, just past the hook and kind of curve it in. Um, again, it gets crumpled. You could not convince me a fish really cares where the legs are, but the legs do make a difference. You can fish this fly without the legs. It works, but the legs really make it look buggy and the fish love it. So, so that's... I guess for without, satellite. The, uh, without What's that? to be very similar to sort of a, a Bob's Bits kind of at that point, no? It's like a Bob's Bits on steroids, probably, I'd say. Yeah. Um, another fly called a Midas, which is which is pretty famous. Uh, it's kind of a ripoff of a hopper, too. Um, so, again, you can see those legs. If you can get them bending down and kind of towards. And I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in a second here. So, there we go. Cool. All right. So looks like if you've ever seen a big chronomid, you can see that looks pretty crumply. Like if I show you like that, like that with the fly, you know, pretty, pretty buggy fly. So as they say, tidy up. So I'm to tidy up your fly. There we go. Bit more seals fur. Uh, notice I am not going to go crazy with uh, the, uh, wax this one I, I don't mind it being a little bit bulkier so i'm gonna i'm gonna brush that out anyways afterwards if i want so if i need floatability in the fly that's the part i'll brush out just brush that turn it the key if you're fishing this fly before i put the hackle on is never gink the whole fly just the top you want this sitting in the in the film with all those legs hanging down and if it sinks under just retrieve it it works all the time don't have to fish it dry. Put it on top drop or put it with a like. Just fish it. Uh, fish it you can pull it. You can let it just flop, sit and uh, float down through the water. Fish it a bunch of different ways. Um, so again, what did Chris say? This is not hen brown hackle. Uh, yeah, Doesn't matter. A roost, like a rooster uh, neck hackle. It's, uh, yeah. it's just a hackle. Um, brown works pretty good. So nothing fancy here i'm gonna tie it in by the there we go tie it in again i'm gonna hackle this one pretty heavy um it's not a, a small fly i'm not losing it I, I pull the fibers back i'm gonna put two or three good wraps there maybe one more for good measure there i like i like mine pretty hackled um some people trim the bottom of the fly um I'll do that with a Bob's bits if you if you know that because you want to sit flush in the in the film because I'm tying this big, um, I find it just kind of sits down anyways. But if you're really neurotic about it, you can cut it. But I figure it just makes it more leggy, and this is just a purposefully kind of in your face buggy, really buggy fly. I don't know. Is that coming through all right, Chris? Does that look pretty yeah. good? Like as you can see I, how buggy that is. I mean, it sure looks buggy from here. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a right. So you just take away that little fly away there, and that, and so black is great. Fiery brown's another good one. You know, go to town with the colors, but you can see where those knotted pheasant tails are the way to go, right? And that's about how I like it. Just the legs splayed past it. Um, trout love that pattern. Um, bass love that pattern. 
you could you could fish it like any way you want and it should be one if you're going to a still i don't care you're going for brook trout up and there you see them moving on top just put it on and see what happens give it a go yeah and that Pretty cool is oops sorry, i'm gonna lose that flight <laughs> cut my thread i think that's a good point like a lot of people you know they i think a lot of people in ontario don't have a ton of still water experience it's not something they're familiar with admittedly we don't have a lot of rainbow or brown trout lakes around here but uh yeah i think we we have a lot of customers who do fish algonquin in the spring and um you know we get asked all the time dry flies or cromas and stuff to fish up there but all these wet flies and stuff work really well too yeah, and you know, for brook trout, deadly, right? That cove nymph, if you need uh, to go up there, but this, if this works everywhere, like everywhere, not nothing's always or for sure, but if you're seeing chronomids flying around, that in a 10 or a 12, again, you can see small gives it too much legs. It's so when Chris is saying a Bob's bits, it's essentially this without the legs. And so when, when this gets into smaller sizes, just take the legs off. Um, one thing I'll do if I'm fishing a Bob's Bits is I'll put one little piece of flash on the bottom, just at the, like the cutthroat cruncher, but just at the bottom, that small fly, that little glint will sometimes, they'll pick it out. So I tie versions with and without that little bit of glint. But when I get into a 12 or a 10, it's hoppers. And this is, I mean, uh, to just Scott's question on the uh, cutthroat cruncher, I'll put this as a middle dropper too. Like I have no trouble doing that. And where I really was uh, kind of brought in this fly, I'm, I'm, um, I'm pro staff at a private club called the Franklin club, which uh, is a, is a, is a, you know, stocked still water. That's uh, obviously private. Um, but I had one of the Scottish champions there years ago, like probably 10 years ago. Uh, and he was one of the easily one of the best lock fishermen in the world. Uh, he was just happened to be in Woodstock visiting his family and called me to say, can you take me fishing? We had met <laughs> at one of the competitions and I said, Canada is a big place. And he said, okay, well I'm in Woodstock. I'm like, Oh, you're like 20 minutes away. I'll come pick you up. Um, but uh, he, he went and Ian James was alive at the time and said, okay, they really like buzzers here. If you want to fish natural. And he put this on a, on a sinking line oh, yeah. with two, two buzzers behind him. I'm like, but that's like a dry fly. He's like, Nope. It works <laughs> just as well under the surface, and it took the most fish. Yeah. Uh, and that was when I first clued into, oh, yeah, there's no rules on this fly. He's like, look at it. Like, it's a wet fly. It's a dry fly. It's a whatever fly. Um, so I would say for this one, have some fun with it. The pheasant tail, and it's a little bit different in the legs, but it's not popular here. It is popular all over the world. Uh, but here's the advantage. You get this to yourself. So, Chris, you fish all over. I'm sure there's situations you'd see this work in many of the places you're around right so yeah yeah absolutely I, like I say it's just buggy like i think that's um you know probably my my favorite thing to look for in a fly and probably you know yours to some extent too is just not necessarily something super imitative but something that does cover a lot of bases and just looks like food <laughs> so yeah and i mean uh, and to simplify f fishing in my the way i think about it is a fish is not analyzing your fly it's making a ban binary choice, food, not food. And they make the not food choice wrong all the time. You, if those who uh, eat fish, you find sticks, you find cigarette butts, you find rocks. Um, they're, they're just constantly in a river, food going by or in a lake going, is that food or not? Binary. And, and it, you know, that just looks probably trigger something that says that probably looks like food i'm gonna try it yeah um it's it's it, that's where the bugginess comes in now if they get really you know if, if something's too flashy mm, that's not food or i don't know what that is okay that's where the naturals come in but a lot of times something flashy also i don't know what that is but i sure know that's not a rock that's probably food so just think food not food binary yeah. um, don't get caught in the I know it's the fun part of fly fishing, but gee, if I'd only tied that with the right, you know, color shade of pheasant tail, that's why I didn't take the fish. No freaking way. Uh, it's either a crappy presentation or it was either they wanted the fly move differently uh, or it's too flashy and they were on naturals or it wasn't flashy it enough them or and it didn't get their attention. So. That's essentially how I think about yeah. fly choice. And I these think would be. I mean, walking in a river with those pheasant tails, feel good about yourself for sure. There is one I forgot, Chris. I know we do. We have time for one more fly. Yeah, I think so. I, I wanted to add one other point too. Is like going back because I think that the binary choice is a great way to think of it. Um, but if you think, you know, in the eyes of a fish, the you know, there's no real downside to eating 
you know, a small rock or a small stick or something. I mean, maybe it doesn't taste great. Maybe it feels a little funny coming out the other end. But the opportunity cost of not eating something for a fish could be greater than the, you know, unpleasantness of passing a rock. So I think, you know, a lot of fish probably more often than not try things out just for, you know, the sake of not missing out. Yeah. And I think the number one reason on a river people don't catch fish is they spook the fish first. Yeah. If you want my opinion, that that lovely, I'm sure Drift has some bright yellow hats. Um, <laughs> we don't you know, have many, I'm proud. Really flashy stuff. Um, a lot of people, when I'm with them, um, those who've been out on the river too, they walk and they put their rod right over the the, the water. That's a shadow. Shadows what? So fish is neurotic for shadows. That's where most death comes from above. Um, so I'm a little bit of caution, reading the water, what's fast water, What's slow water? Okay, slow water, I can't get as close as I could in fast water. That's why you tend to catch more fish in riffles and stuff like that. Yeah, there's more a lot of fish feeding there, but it's also easier for us. Um, so, and also, they, ha you know, the type of water should dictate your fly. Like a fast river or fast water, that fly is making a, that fish is making a really quick binary choice. Uh, that, that fish sipping back where we're going to throw the, the plume tip on, it's it's seeing the same food coming it's in that little feeding lane it's got it channeled in there it's got lots of time to look at it food not food i don't know i mean about ten thousand things that look like food that last thing wasn't on my like wasn't my on my radar right so um so that that's that's a little bit of a really simplistic way of thinking about it so i did forget one all we'll go full circle back to the pheasant tail now. <laughs> i'm not going to tie it because you know how we tie it but i wanted to comment on one uh, bead choice. I totally forgot about it. White. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I see how much that stands out when I just put that on there. Um, so the, I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you the story. I, I feel like an old man around the fire cause we're at the end here. Let me tell you a story about the white bead and my love for the white bead. So we were in, um, actually in Northern Ireland preparing, uh, for, um, we were trying to defend our gold medal in the Commonwealth. We ended up getting the silver, but I was with uh, one of the top guides over there, uh, and we spent the morning together. Um, and he's he's a he's actually a famous fly tire over there, and, and he does a uh, uh, lots of videos online. Um, and he was their their rivers look the same as the Grand, like that tea colored. Uh, and and when we find we we're in these competitions, you kind of try to file away as much information as you can. Uh, and it just sometimes there's those moments where you think back like a dream sequence and somebody says something you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> that, that. That was interesting information. He was going on and on about white beads. And I was like, like, whatever, man. Like, I don't like white beads. Why would I fish a white bead? He's like, I'm telling you, when we were in Italy at the World Championships, it was the white bead. And, he, and I'm like, yeah, sure it is. Uh, <laughs> we tried fishing it that day. It didn't work. And he's like, I'm just telling you. If it's the fourth quarter and you're you're running at a time, white bead. I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, so I tied up a few. Same pheasant tail we tied. Uh, the only difference is just a straight pheasant tail or throwing a little bit of black ice stub behind it. Nothing fancy because it's, it's a white bead. Um, so I was in one session on a river. I had a kind of a crappy stretch uh, of river. And I remember this because uh, the, the river was very, very – tough to get in and out of so the controllers or the people who measure your fish were allowed to walk behind you so me and this young fellow walked up this really long beat that we had never seen before i just know nobody had caught more than one fish on it um and we just covered water and i was fishing between dry flies and nymphs and then we covered the whole thing once and found okay there's a few fish sitting here i had maybe two or three um as light started to fade it was in the afternoon session and there was really high trees I maybe had three fish on the board, 20 minutes left. And I'm like, yeah, it's not horrible, but it's not great. Uh, I know there's a ton of fish kind of sitting in here. Why can't I? I tried everything. At that time, you could use squirmies. I tried the pheasant tail with the, like all the stuff I just had. Nope, nothing. And I'm like, white bee. <laughs> if it's, a, hey, it's a fourth quarter. Yeah, Try that stupid back, white yeah. bee fly. And it was, just, it was a 16 white bee, first cast fish, second cast fish. And I, I am not kidding you. I caught 14 fish uh, in the last 20 minutes. Uh, and he was, he was right beside me. I'm just like, here, measure it. Boom, boom, boom. Every cast, uh, to that, you know, something that solidifies, uh, uh, and by the way, the guy above me and below got one fish each. Um, and then nobody caught any fish really on that section. Again, I've tried the white bead in certain situations. It sucks. What I figured out with it is it's, it's a big contrast fly. And I thought a lot of, so if I do 
anything where there's contrast of. Uh, if you get those dark days, those over, you know, those days you want to use a chartreuse or mm -hmm. an orange, white bead, man. <laughs> so <laughs> just give it a swim. Like if it doesn't work, but it's an all or nothing. Don't bank on the white bead. Try it. It's a horrible fly on clear water or anything because it's very aggressive actually. But in that tea colored water, when you put it in there, boy, does it ever stand out. And uh, don't tie it in big, like, you know, 14, 16, 18, nothing. I mean, and I fish it more in 16s. Um, it is a great variation just by bead alone that most people don't fish here. So there's a little secret I let out. I don't show that one to many people, but for all you guys who joined here today, it's a good one in the back pocket for the, remember me and just say, oh, it's a dark day. I'm not catching anything. I know there's fish in there. Let me give the white bead a swim. But after ten, five, 10 minutes, take it off. That's it's like a mop fly. I'll give it a swim and then I'll give up on it. Yeah. But when it's on and I've crushed on the grand on that, in that dour kind of weather, it's just, that's kind of when it shines. So cool. forgot to I forgot that one. I actually put it here to tie it, but I don't need to tie it. You just, you get it. Yeah. Same, same deal. That's a good little treat for everyone who stuck around till the end here. All right. That's awesome. So we've so, got you coming back. I am proud to say, uh, let me just double check on the date, make sure I get it right. We've got you back on February 11th. Ooh, February 11th, all right, same time. We'll be deep. It will be in the deep freeze then for sure. Oh yeah. Um, and I guess if anybody has any questions, Chris, you'll leave my. They, they're welcome to flip me an email or anything like that. We can share contact info. Yep. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yep, 100. percent So, yeah, uh, we've got you back. Uh, you are, as we covered off the top, uh, a local guide, and one that we're proud to to work with and refer out to. Um, so if anyone's looking at booking you for for this year too, hopefully we'll have a great trout season coming. Yeah, and I'll be uh, I'll be doing some. I'm putting together now some um, basic, you know, intro to nymph nymph fishing and dry flies, and some really advanced stuff too. So for those who are looking to kind of hone some skills, I, I haven't put it you know dates together we're watching covid all the stuff people are doing i might just end up doing a virtual one um but if there's some interest in that uh happy to you know maybe make a session for people who are here but it, uh, there'll be some some intro to euro and dry flight and then i'll do some kind of really advanced stuff for those who have an appetite for that piece there's a lot of really good anglers i'm sure on the lineup i know there are but people are asking the questions so that's that really advanced stuff but i don't want to scare people away there's there'll be a lot on the um i just want to learn how to do some of this stuff Otherwise, just book me and we'll go out for a day. And uh, my style is much more education based. So we'll, uh, I, I'm more excited when you write me the next day that you caught a fish without me than catching a big fish with me. Not that we won't uh, can do a few big fish uh, once in a while, but uh, it's much more about learning how to make you a better angler. So if that's a, that's your kind of your gig, uh, reach out to me anytime. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome. And uh, yeah, you are absolutely. Uh, and I'm not just as because you're here, one of our, uh, you know, top picks for around here. Um, you really can't do a whole lot better than, than Ian for learning. So anyone who's interested in getting out, learning a few things for trout this coming season, definitely recommended. Endorsed by Drift here, and uh, yeah, we'll see you in a couple weeks, I guess. Um, yeah, this is fun. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. I didn't get to see who was here, but uh, thanks for a great format, and hopefully uh, it was useful. And, Absolutely. Uh, Oh, we those pheasant tails. I should until it's all about <laughs> hair's ears in February. <laughs> yeah, hair's ears next. I should have a good one as well. Thanks. Just quickly, have a great night. Uh, we do have uh, Saturday's stream as well. Uh, I think Ian's tuned. All right, he's not just tuned out yet. Saturday, we've got uh, Patrick. Patrick Ann coming on. Uh, him and I are both going to be tying. We're going to be tying some uh, some steelhead flies, kind of going back and forth, tying the same flies and, and chatting about uh, you know how better our fly tying and all that good stuff. So make sure you tune in for that. That's Saturday, 10 a.m. as well. And with that, I'll let you guys go and have a good night. Have a great night, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay.